This stately structure that represents our state is showing its wear and tear. We discuss efforts to restore the Capitol building in Capitol Report. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. From its crumbling exterior to its antiquated interior, the State Capitol building is a shadow of its typical stately grandeur. The building is 107 years old and when you look at the history of the building, the superstructure was actually pretty much completed by the turn of the century so that exterior marble is even older than 107 years. The building is showing its age, but plans are in place to restore and renovate the Capitol. Experts contend it will take roughly a quarter of a billion dollars to complete the necessary work to repair the People's House. A lot of the problems have been because of water infiltration. Uh, we had the dome repaired just this last year or a year and a half ago and, and that has really stopped the water penetrating into the plaster spaces and the decorative painting areas. So that's when you look inside the building there is a lot of plaster damage, there's a lot of uh, streaks on, on paintings that you know basically as water has been dripping over them at a, over a considerable amount of time. And some work has been done in the third floor uh, ceiling and the corridors to restore that entire uh, third level and that really is a, a testament of what this building will look like in the future. The uh, work that's been or will be done on the Capitol is really uh, mostly on the exterior as of now. Um, in the past, there really hasn't been a lot of complete restoration packages or, or processes. Most of everything you'll see as part of any restoration work has been inside in the legislative chambers and some of the spaces. Uh, but this is really the first attempt to start preserving and uh, repairing and replacing the exterior marble as needed. And that's one thing. Uh, that's a really important part of this process is a very thorough examination has been completed of the exterior marble and because of that process we found there's pieces that are loose, that have been broken off and that will have to be either repaired or replaced as part of this project begins. And that is the ultimate goal, bringing the building into the 21st century in function while retaining its historical integrity. A lot of the piping is still the original. The drains are still the original cast iron pipes, so those will have to be replaced. There's a lot of the mechanical systems have just kind of been piecemealed together, patched as needed to, to make the building operable and livable as a workspace. And so there's a lot of changes that will be taking place with the mechanical units, and they're even uh, devising plans uh, in the attic spaces above the third floor to build mechanical rooms instead of uh, what they presently have in the basement. So there's some significant changes that you, the public won't see, but behind the scenes will really make the building a much safer, much more you know, workable space. And we have the Commissioner of Administration, Spencer Kronk, joining us now to talk a little bit about what's next with those report repairs. Commissioner, thanks for joining me. It's great to be here. Let's begin with, as I said, the the repairs to the Capitol building. And I want to start with a quote by Representative Dean Erdahl. This was on April 19th, and he stated, our consulting architect has told us that if the Capitol were a medical patient, the exterior is on life support. Would you agree with this statement? Absolutely. I mean, we had the, this consultant come in and, and he's worked on a number of state capitals across the country and also seen buildings in Europe that have been in a constant state of deterioration. And his advice to us was that it's not just on, on life support of the exterior, but all the functioning arteries, the plumbing, the mechanics of the building itself are in serious need of, of repair. And so if we don't fix it now, we could see ourselves in a state of repair for the next hundred years. And so if we don't do something significant now, then we will be seeing the, the type of disrepair uh, that just won't be able to be completed unless uh, we do something uh, concrete. And to that point, in the last legislative session, there was an initial request for $221 million for capital restorations. That bill did not pass. However, eventually the legislature did approve $44 million. So where do you even begin with that kind of money for, for repairs that are, as you just mentioned, very extensive? Sure. Well, I just want to step back and say, although it wasn't the full amount, it was certainly the biggest uh, contribution that this legislature, legislature has uh, committed to this project. Uh, we have seen the need for this work for decades and the fact that there was $44 million uh, put to it in large part uh, by the work of Representative Howes and Representative Dean um, as well as uh, significant uh, champions on the Senate and with the governor's office. Uh, but we want to 
get the process started. And so that $44 million will help us ensure that the design team has been placed, the, the construction manager is in place, and so they can start working out the details of as further funding gets allocated, what we would be doing with that. There are a few projects that need to get underway right now. We're going to be looking at the drum windows in the dome. They will be replaced uh, soon. There's a tunnel that's going to be under the University Avenue that will be happening this summer and completed in November of this year. Uh, and then we want to ensure that the, the finial, the, the little uh, lantern on top of the Capitol, is regilded, and that will be happening in the next couple of weeks. Commissioner, this is the People's House, and we've been kind of talking about how extensive these repairs are going to be. So I guess this is a good chance to explain to the people how you even, you've talked about the beginning stages, but how do you move through such an extensive process, and, and how long do you think it's going to take? We have the whole project estimated between four and five years, but we are fortunate that there was a, a commission set up in, in statute last session, in the 2011 s session, and that includes uh, leaders from the House, the Senate, the Governor's Office, the Attorney General's Office, uh, the, the Supreme Court, all the tenants of the building that can represent what those needs are, because ultimately this is, uh, it needs to be a functioning building. It's not just a landmark that our state has, but it's a, a function of our government, and we need to ensure that it, it functions well and effectively, not just during the restoration period, but after that period that it's functioning for the people of Minnesota. Minnesota. Uh, with that commission in place, we believe that we have the right people to be making those decisions. Those decisions are not made by myself, the Commissioner of Administration. They are made by those individuals that will be leading the charge in completing the restoration effort. Okay, Commissioner, let's move on to your role as Commissioner of Administration. And you were quoted just after you were appointed, stating, now more than ever, government needs to learn how to do more with less. And I'm committed to enhancing the interagency cooperation and eliminating unnecessary redundancies in order to create a leaner, more cost-effective government that delivers high-quality professional services to citizens. There were several pieces of legislation these past two sessions that do move in this direction, including back office consolidation, sharing expense services. Um, explain how these all fit into your vision and where you'd like to go from here. Absolutely. I think one of the, the two key tenants that I came into it, as you just stated, were using data to drive decision making uh, in state government and we really feel that this administration has been moving in that direction. We want to make sure that anything that we do, particularly on the side of administration, administrative reform, um, uses good data. And so some of the individual pieces of legislation that passed last session around the, uh, the benchmarking uh, study for back office services uh, and also uh, figuring out how to best provide administrative services for small boards and commissions, uh, we're using data to inform those decisions. The second piece is really uh, leaning on the expertise of state employees. We believe that uh, state employees have, they're, they're the best model for providing a great customer service. They're the direct service providers. We want to rely on their expertise. They've been doing this for decades. And to the extent that we can leverage their expertise, we will be doing so. So using the, the data better and using state employees more effectively is, is certainly a key on my priority list. And do you have a particular area that you'd like to see handled and addressed next? and quickly? I think we're really focused on how to do this back office uh, services better. I think we, we have a number of state agencies that are already working more effectively within their departments. So divisions are sharing services. Some agencies are even sharing services. But to the extent that we can leverage that at scale is going to be really important to this administration. Uh, I also created a strategic partnership unit within the Department of Administration to focus solely on that. We're working with Minsky. We're working with the U of M. We're working with the Minnesota business partnership to think about how we can leverage those resources in other agencies and other units of government um, that can help provide the best value for Minnesota citizens. Okay, with those words, Commissioner Spencer Kronk, thanks so much for taking time to appear on Capitol Report. We certainly appreciate Not it. Not a problem. I appreciate it. Late last year, Governor Mark Dayton had issued an executive order allowing for a vote of child care providers to unionize. In June, a district court judge ruled the governor overreached his authority. On Tuesday, the governor stated he would not appeal this decision.
Representative Larry Howes led the effort to get a full $221 million for the capital restorations and renovations. He's here now to talk about what's next for the building and about the bonding bill in general. Thanks for joining us, Representative Howes. Well, thanks for having me. Let's begin with the Capitol building, and I want to begin with a quote from your colleague, Dean Erdahl. He stated, quote, our consulting architect has told us that if the Capitol were a medical patient, the exterior is on life support. Would you agree with this statement? Almost. I would almost agree. I have a different opinion. My opinion is the Capitol has a lot of acne, but the arteries and the nervous system are deteriorating faster, and it's a combination of the two. So just by replacing the stonework, you still have the inside of the body that's going to die. And he went on to talk about the condition internally as well and how yeah. it's critical as well. So you authored the bill to appropriate $221 million for the building. Eventually, the legislature did approve $44 million. Now, it's difficult for a layperson to try to wrap their arms around such an extensive project, but how much can get done, in your opinion, with $44 million? Not a very lot. You, you have to come forward with a bid, a plan. And, and to bid and plan a job that's 221 million with only 40 million available, any contractor's gonna hedge their bets, as it were, because they're not sure if more money will come. And the architectural fees alone, I believe, are 20 million. So what would you like to see done? In, in what order would you like to see it done? Well, I wanted all the money to start with. Uh, spread out over four years, 77 to start with, knowing then the contractor would know everything else is going to be in place unless the legislature changes the law, which I don't think they ever would have at that point. So that would have been the best bet. Then we could have gotten a guaranteed price, a guaranteed schedule, and everybody would have uh, known what's going on. But this way, there is no real schedule. It's when the 40 million runs out, and hopefully next year they'll, I would, I would well, if I'm here next year and still chair, I would, move to for for 180 million right away and you did just answer my next question i was going to ask you what would be next it's arguably it's going to be a, a very mm -hmm. different legislative makeup right there's also an expected or a projected budget deficit what are the chances of getting that additional funding i think at this point because of the 44 we invested i think it's critical that we finish the job it's next year will be an off year for bonding but yet whether or not I'm in the majority or the minority, I would bring bill, a bill forward. And I think uh, Representative Halsman, if, if she's in the majority, would probably have the same impression, same idea. Okay, Representative Howes, the Capitol building funding was, as I mentioned, eventually placed in the bonding bill. Now, when this larger Capitol building bill did die, many doubted whether or not there'd be any bonding bill at all. So what changed on that day to allow for the eventual passage of a bonding bill? Patience and patience and patience. I was reasonably confident there would be a bonding bill. We just had to wait and let everything else happen in the order that it happened. And the bonding bill is always one of the last things except for that, what we do, some ballpark or stadium or something, I can't recall. I heard a little something yeah, you about You are that. wearing kind of a purple color, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am, and you're not. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing. So this bonding bill did eventually total $496 million. Many in the DFL did criticize the fact that it excluded many local projects such as civic centers. So in your opinion, was this bill perhaps a sign of what bonding bills might look like in the future where they're more uh, focused on statewide infrastructure and perhaps less on local projects? Well, I recall when uh, Ventura came in. And he came in the same time I did. And he started this by saying, there won't be any local projects. The bonding bill won't be a, a vehicle for pork, for all you uh, fill in the blank as to what he called us, w t uh, to get reelected. So it started there. And for four years, we sort of shied away from tagging particular jobs. Uh, let's say a, the DNR was going to get money for parks and trails. We wouldn't necessarily define a trail, let the DNR do that in their order of choice. But Palenti drifted away from that a little bit, but still in some sense held that line. And the new uh, majority of, of Republicans in the House and Senate did not want the so-called earmark. Now, 
I think it's the legislature's job to specify where the money goes. And if you want to call it an earmark, I suppose you can, but it's not like Washington where you, I mean, that's really an earmark. But that was the, the way things went this year, so we had to be very careful how we crafted it without trying to make anything too local. What about the total, 496 million, significantly higher than your initial proposal? Are you, were you good with it? Were you happy with it? Well, yeah, I think it was a very good bill, but it's, it's higher than the original because if you recall, I had 221 for the capital, for the capital removed and 240 from it. for, so it was 460 something. So in essence, the total is a little higher than what I originally started with, but it worked well. We spread it all through the state, and I think we did some very good projects. And what would you have liked to have seen included that perhaps did not make it in? Maybe a little bit more for the University of Minnesota, a little bit more for roads and bridges, uh, quite a bit more for wastewater. Uh, we need that throughout rural Minnesota. I know folks in the metropolitan area don't understand rural Minnesota with wastewater or septic systems. Uh, they just don't get it because everything here is done by the Met Council and they flush the toilet and they don't have to worry about anything. But up there, it's, it's a lot more critical. So Chair House, my last question for you then is next session, it's not traditionally a bonding session. However, mm -hmm. bonding bills have come through the first year of a, of a biennium. Yes, so sir. if you are chair, would you push for one again, perhaps a smaller version of one to it? Yes, I would. Those? I would push to finish the capital and then there's always the uh, flood issue, whether or not we need some money for that, or if there's a, a tornado or some catastrophic event that happens, and you know that does on occasion, so we do that. But I think the large bonding bill would be saved for the following year, but I believe we need to finish the capital. Okay, Representative Larry House, thank you for your time and perspective. We appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Ken Kelash has been a strong proponent of job creation. He's here to talk a little bit about the bonding bill, the Capital Restoration Project, and about his career in the Senate. Senator, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yes. Let's begin, Senator, with your background in labor. Okay. And the DFL, of course, typically pushes for a larger bonding bill. The governor's proposal was more than $700 million. What do you think of the final package and the final dollar amount? Well, I, th I think it's probably one of the better packages we could have gotten based on the fact that the DFL was in the minority. Uh, I think in many cases we were lucky to get what we've got. Um, you know, uh, we would have rather have seen a bigger bill because there's still so much unemployment. The state still has a lot of needs for reconstruction and upgrading bridges, schools, whatever. And uh, so a bigger bill would have been helpful in a variety of ways. Money's never been cheaper for the state to borrow. All those things factor in, and, and we should have had a bigger bonding bill, but we have to take what we could get. And it would not have passed without a strong DFL major minority supporting it. So. And the crafting of the bill left out a lot of yes, projects that are considered local projects. Do you think this is a sign of maybe what future bonding bills are going to look like with more statewide emphasis? Uh, oh, I think that depends on who the majority is next year more than anything because I think uh, I think some of the, the things that were left out were definitely economic development terms and regional economic development things such as the Rochester Civic Center and and uh, Mankato and, and St. Cloud Civic Centers. They're all going, you know, if built, they're going to generate uh, uh, outside money coming into the state as tourist dollars and conventions come in. Uh, Rochester in particular with the Mayo's influence there, bringing in uh, doctors for conferences, things like that. Th I think that would be a, a real benefit to the state. And uh, like I said, I think it's a regional asset, not just a Rochester proper asset. So. Uh, that's okay. where I look at that, yeah. And as far as the Capitol building restoration, at one mm -hmm. point there was an attempt in the House to right. pass a bill for $221 million to essentially restore and repair this Capitol building. The result was $44 million tucked into that bonding bill, but if the bigger bill would have passed the House and moved to the Senate, would you have supported it? Well, I, I think um, it's a different, I, it, I support the whole package. The thing is, is that can we step it out over a few years? And I think that was really the argument that folks on the Capital Improvement Committee made as well, is that we didn't need to do the whole 200 right now because it'd be several years before it gets spent out. But it just, that $44 million, I think, does commit future legislators to continue the improvement. The 44 million just gets the gets it started and you'll probably see 
uh, the capital and the bonding bill n uh, next year and maybe even the year after. That does put a lot into future legislature right. legislatures. Mm -hmm. Sh is it something that should be trusted to folks in the future, or should it have been done in one big step, though? If if you would have had well, I, I, of think, this? I think I um, think considering, I, I think one of the things is the capital is is not a uh, shovel ready project, shall we say? It wasn't ready to go. It needs some design work. So the way we did it this year, and being able to spend the other, um, you know, uh, two hundred million in other parts of the state if that was all the total amount we were going to get is probably a better economic development for this year and based on I think I think uh, the folks I talked to on the commission said the 44 million was going to get us a good start and, and be able to plan for the future and uh, make sure we have the, get this capital back up to the way it was originally uh, looking and and get the maintenance done on this uh, you know statewide Senator, Jim. you had referenced future legislatures a bit uh, just a few moments ago, and you have opted to not seek re-election. So I want to talk to you real quickly about uh, one thing that you were very vocal about this past session was your opposition to the Freedom to Work proposal. You called it the Freedom to Work for Less proposal. Mm -hmm. It didn't gain a lot of sa a lot of traction this session. So. What do you think was the driving force in it kind of stalling? I, I think that the labor movement was here consistently, constantly, and talking to both sides of the aisle and letting them know what this provision would do. I think probably some of the things that happened in in uh, Wisconsin, even though the election didn't turn out the way I would have liked it, but I think some of that uh, also calmed things about tr uh, a strong push for that uh, this year. Um, it just wasn't getting the traction. There's too many, uh, too many uh, good things about the labor movement in in Minnesota uh, that uh, I think we want to preserve. So, okay, Senator, on your website, you wrote, "Quote: Government should work to improve people's lives, to make communities great places to live, work, learn, and play, to build on the successes of the past, and prepare for the community of the future." So in your time in office, do you believe that you helped improve people's lives? Well, I think um, there's a few bills that I managed to, to get uh, accomplished, uh, you know, realizing that we had a Republican governor and then I was in the minority the last two years. Um, you know, the uh, uh, mental, uh, the mental courts decisions to pull gun rights, getting that added to the National Register for uh, background checks was a big one. Things like uh, uh, the um, lead abatement provision in, in the permitting process just added another layer of oversight so that folks that were doing lead abatement, at least somebody on doing that work was aware of all the, the uh, hazards that can be for the person, the people doing that as well as whosoever house that was. Uh, some of the environmental things like uh, Lake Drawdown and, and being able to do that I think helped people's lives. The workers' comp things like that, I, th I think, were a benefit. So, I would have, uh, I would have liked to have continued in the Senate. I got redistricted out into a tough district, and and uh, so I, I'm not able to do that. But uh, I think that the potential of having a Democratic House and Senate with a Democratic governor for the first time in 20 years would allow a lot of good things to happen where we're not fighting. Well, Democrats will fight with each other to get the best bill from a variety of things, but at least we aren't going to be fighting blind ideology or uh, the constant campaign uh, uh, points that seem to be going on every legislative. Every bill is about how's it going to look in the next campaign. I, th I think we can get past that if we have a DFL majorities and the d DFL. Uh, governor. So what would your advice be then to incoming legislators of each party? Uh -huh. What would my advice be? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's you have to show up here with the idea that you're going to govern and that governing means that you have to do the most for, uh, do the best you can uh, for uh, the people of Minnesota, that uh, the people of Minnesota, I think, uh, have uh, rightly invested in themselves, their infrastructure, their education, and uh, that uh, dismantling that for the sake of tax cuts is not uh, a good economic philosophy or it does not take us in the right direction. So I think the idea being is, is that what's been right about Minnesota, and we've got a good track record of that already, let's look at that and continue doing that. And Senator, we are, and I don't I'm mean to sorry. cut you off, I apologize. Yeah. We are just about out of time, but I want to close with um, giving you an opportunity to 
say something to your constituents. Oh, sure. Um, you know, I've had four years in the Senate, and the folks in Richfield, Bloomington, and Southwest Minneapolis have done, it was a great honor to be able to serve them. Uh, I found that it was very, uh, you know, very fulfilling that I, I found that there were some smart people there with great ideas, that I, I moved some legislation as a result, and uh, I, I think I just uh, really enjoyed the process and uh, wished I would have been able to continue, so. Okay, thank Senator, you. thank you for yeah, coming yes, in. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. In this program, we've tried to explain some of the challenges involved in restoring a building such as the state capitol. The windows in the dome will be replaced shortly with a more rain-resistant product. John Brune details what went into the design and construction of the dome, which was considered the engineering marvel of its time. Underneath the state capitol dome's magnificent marble facade is a unique and innovative structural design one that caused architect Cass Gilbert many hours of deliberation. In his desire to create a non-traditional structure that was graceful and not overpowering of the St. Paul skyline, Gilbert found that his visually appealing design lacked the required structural support. After numerous consultations with dome engineers, architects, and builders, Gilbert found a solution to the problem and continued with the project. The Capitol Dome in St. Paul is considered unique because of its three domes in one design. The outer dome, constructed of marble, is self-supporting. The inner dome, visible from the Capitol Rotunda, is beautifully decorated and highlighted by a stunning crystal chandelier. Hidden between them is a third dome, a cone with steel ribs rising up to the outer dome, which gives support to the lantern that crowns the top of the Capitol building. Gilbert's design was unique because of the structural challenges presented and because of his belief that previous dome construction designs were flawed. As he studied other domes, Gilbert realized that the inner and outer domes of those structures were built as one and bonded together with brick and mortar. Because of that construction design, moisture could seep through the mortar to the inner dome, causing structural damage and costly annual repairs. Gilbert's capital dome was different Inside of the outer marble shell, the steel ribs of the inner cone were filled in with masonry, essentially creating a dome. The outside was then waterproofed. Any moisture that would seep in through the outer marble dome would then flow down the waterproof dome and drain away, preventing damage to the beautiful inner dome that lies beneath. Through the struggles of Cass Gilbert's vision for a capital dome in St. Paul came a revered innovative structure that is to this day a marvel of architectural design. And that concludes this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching Capitol Reports.